Good, so so? Okay. So what I want to show you today is how much fun you can actually have with technology. How many of you are Java developers? Okay. And how many of you are Java embedded developers? Okay, well the good news is all of you who raise your hand, you can be Java embedded developers too because it's the same thing. And that's what I wanna show you today. That's what I show you, uh, what we're working on the APIs, how Java SE embedded and Java ME embedded are changing to have you creating an amazing application. And again, we're moving into having one single language. So forget about Java ME and different languages, it's all Java. So we're gonna have Java working on all these toys, okay? How many of you owns or have seen a Raspberry Pi? Raspberry Pi, okay, cool. So we're gonna be using the Raspberry Pi. The only reason is I like it. Uh, I think it's a great small computer and support both Java ME embedded and Java SE embedded, okay? Um, I'm probably going to give you a lot of information, but I, what I wanted to do was show you demos. So basically I have a demo for everything. We're gonna talk about ser serial communication. We're gonna talk about GPIOs, how can we program those? Uh, devices that's using I square C, all of that, how we can actually program and have some fun. So, what is happening in technology is forget about big host machines, forget about the PC that you have at home, forget about all that. We're going into the Internet of Things. So we're talking about little sensors that are going to be running Java, collecting information and sending it back to the server for analyzing that data. Think about your grandmother. Your grandmother can have a heart rate monitor. That heart rate monitor can be monitoring the, her the heart, sensing it, collecting the data, and passing it over to her doctor. So if the heart rate drops, they know something is wrong. Everything is gonna be connected. Your car, your uh, home, uh, the refrigerator, everything is gonna be connected. And the good thing is Java runs the same on all those devices, right? So remember, most of the time, those little devices has very, very specific, sometimes not even an operating system per se is running. But Java has a place for everything. Again, there is a huge opportunity. So we're looking in trillion of Internet of Things that are connected, that are going to be connected. Trillions. We're not talking about millions. We're talking about trillions of little things connecting, sensing the environment, and using that data. So what happened today? So we have this big picture about Java, and we have what we used to call Java ME, right? And if you see, so Java ME was what uh, has two configurations, CLDC and CDC. And if you pay attention related to the APIs, they were different from Java APIs, right? So developer had to learn those, right? What is happening with the new release of JD or Java 8 that include not only SE but also embedded. Now see how the APIs are overlapping now. So Java ME is becoming more of a Java APIs. And finally, we're gonna have something like this. So the language is gonna be the same. We're talking about lambdas in the Java SE language. We're gonna have lambdas too on small devices on Java ME and the language is going to be the same. The APIs are going to be the same. There's going to be maybe one different, that is the portion that got outside. That's what we call the device access APIs. Those are APIs that allow you to connect to peripherals. 
to connect you with sensors, with lights, with LEDs, with switches, with motors. So those very specific APIs are the ones that probably won't be being part of the whole Java SE. Now, what I have here is the Raspberry Pi, okay? A small computer that can run Java, but it can run both Java SE embedded and Java ME embedded. So which one should you choose? If you're going to create an application, how do I decide which one? Well, there is a couple of things that you should think about it. First, user interface. Are you going to have a UI? Are you going to have a user interface? If you do so, EMI doesn't provide you with a good user interface. Java SE embedded has all the UI that you need, included Java FX. So one of the demos is running Java FX on the Raspberry Pi, okay? If you're going to connect a lot of sensors, so you have in the Raspberry Pi, you have actually a set of pins where you can connect and have fun. Well, Java SE doesn't have a good APIs yet to talk to those, to talk through the GPIO pins. So in that case, maybe you're good to go with Java ME embedded. So, okay, there are options. Think about this kind of application you're trying to create and see which one fits you better because both can run on the Raspberry Pi. The presentation will cover both. So when I talk about GPIOs, for example, turning an LED on and off or reading from a switch, I'm going to show you how it will be done on SE embedded and ME embedded. For today, again, I'm going to be using the Raspberry Pi. The only reason it's very popular nowadays, it's very cheap, it's $5, so most of people can get one. Um, the idea of the Raspberry Pi actually uh, started in, in UK by Raspberry Pi Labs and they were concerned because young people are not really starting to become engineers. They're becoming to know how to use a web browser. They don't know how to really a web browser works. They know how to use it, but they don't know the, 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 the things behind it. So that's how this uh, little guy was created. So the students in the UK can learn more about programming really and computer science. And again, this little guy is really powerful. So this is what we have. And the important part and what I'm gonna cover today is this part here, okay? So we have a HDMI connector so we can connect to a TV so if you have at home a TV that has a HDMI connection, you can connect it to your HDMI. Um, you can plug, it has USB, so you can plug a keyboard or a mouse to it, or different things. For example, we're gonna use in one of the demos a mind reader. So we're gonna try to m read my mind with the Raspberry Pi, okay? So two USB ports and some header pins. This is the fun part. With the header pins is where you can actually start connecting things and have fun, right? So we have GPIO, we have WART or serial communication, and we have SPI and IS2C. There are two protocols that are widely being used today. Um, the Java version, so this guy is actually powered by a small SD card. So Linux, there is a Linux flavor running on it that it gets boot from the SD card. And it's called Raspbian. This Raspbian use, is using a special version of Java. The, the difference that we have is most of the small um, devices like this one do not have support in the hardware itself for floating point. So most of the time, 
they simulate floating points via software, okay? But this guy is so good and so powerful, so it does have support for hard floating point. So the floating point is already in, in the hardware. It's supported by the hardware directly. So there is a special version of Java that runs on it to take advantage of the hard float point that is in here. So this is the fun part. So that's the guy, the Raspberry Pi, and here we have the pins. So this is where we connect things. And these pins translate to this. So we have power. Most of the sensors that you need, or the LEDs, are powered between three volts and five volts. So the Raspberry Pi has a pins that provide you with that voltage so you can connect them. You have GPIO, so you can connect switches, so we're gonna have a motor, a Lego motor, etc. We have I square C that we're gonna talk about it, and SPI. And we also have WART for serial communication. And this is just the same picture, just a little bit bigger. And this is really the diagram you need when you're programming the Raspberry Pi. So, first one, how do you use um, the, the, the WART line that comes in the Raspberry Pi? So normally these devices, most of the time, are gonna be running headless. So you do not have a display, okay? So to have a, series, a console where you can actually see what's going on is very useful. So we created a console, very simple. The reason that we need a chip, this particular one that is 3232, is because the word line that comes on the Pi is only giving us three volts. And the standard for the serial port is 12 volts. So we need to bump up the three volts up to 12 to be able to conform the standards. Okay, so this guy over here allow us to do that, bump up the voltage, so we take the input from the Raspberry Pi and you can actually connect to your computer via serial port, okay? Now, USBs. There are many devices that work with USBs. So what do I have here? Do you like games, right? So everybody recognize something like this, right? So this has a USB. So if I connect it to the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi is able to see the device, you should be able to program it, okay? Next, the mind reader, okay? This is supposed to be reading my mind. And in the other hand, we have a dongle that is USB. So this goes to the Raspberry Pi. It's gonna read my mind, send it to the dongle in the Raspberry Pi, and via USB, I'm gonna read the information, okay? Not very reliable, by the way, but anyway. Uh, what else do we have? This guy. Okay. So we found this in, in, in Amazon. It's only like $40, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, and again, USB connector, you plug it in, it's able to see it. How do you program these devices? Okay. So the first one is, if you connect it and it sees, that means if you see an entry on the slash dev, a slash TTY, for example, USB zero, then you're able to program it. More complex devices might need a native code. So you can actually install the live USB for that. Okay, that might help. Uh, then you have APIs like Java.com that allow you to talk and connect um, to it. So for example, you can install the RxTx package. And with the Java.com, is looking for a device named TTYS001 or S002, okay? When you connect these guys, they're gonna be discovered as USBs. So the way we did to work around it is just rename it. So we created a system property where we renamed the ports to be USBs instead of the TTYS that they were waiting for. Um, 
so the first guy that we tried to connect to was the this guy uh, comes with a USB interface um, so what you normally end up doing is a, a native interface and around it a, you create a wrapper class using GNI GNI will then provide you with a clean Java user interface that you can actually connect to for this one we have a very simple protocol three bytes to move the motors arm base and light there is a light on the on the front and we just to combine movement we have to, the only back draw is we have to stop all the motors at the same time to be able to go with the next movement okay again C API C functions wrapped into GNI and then from Java you call it as a normal Java method so you can say move the arm uh, wait a little bit then stop and do something else okay for the game controller before I go to the first demo um, for this one we use a library that has been around for a while and it's called JUnit okay um, hasn't been, it's very mature, it hasn't been touched since 2003. Um, we just recompile it for the Raspberry Pi. And then the game controller is very simple. Pretty much we create an object. We say that we want to listen to changes. For example, if you push the buttons or the joystick, we we'll listen to it. We start a thread that is listening and then you have the action so if something happened in one of the bottom do something if something happened in the joystick do something okay so let's do the first couple of demos uh, for that I need my Raspberry Pi what did I do with my Raspberry Pi okay the way I'm going to plug the Raspberry Pi, I just have a USB cable, so it's going to be powered by my computer. And then the way I'm going to do is, is I'm just using, um, normally if, if you're on Windows, you will need a crossover cable, so I just have a static IP address, so I'm just going able to talk to them. Uh, so let's power it on. We, some see, we should see some lights. So it's actually powered on. If we don't see the lights, it means it didn't start, so we try again. It happened a couple of times. Come on. Okay. Now we have three lights, so it's good. Okay. So let's see if I can connect. Um, I'm actually... I'm going to, uh, okay, it, it should be. So what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to SSH to the, so the Raspberry Pi has an IP of 10.0.0.11. It takes a little bit in the first communication, but then we should be okay. It takes like a minute to connect the first time. So the first one, let's try this guy. Okay, now we got it. Let me log in. Okay. What you, oh, sorry. I have capital logs. Give me one second, we're gonna do it again. So what I did is I just connected to one of the USBs. And then the second, let's connect both. And the second one to the other USB. Okay. Start it on. Okay. Okay, so we are in.
So this is the Raspberry Pi. So what I'm gonna run first is the GPath. So I'm just verifying that I'm able to read from the joystick. So if I go up and down, center, the other joysticks, and then the... So I just wanna make sure that I'm able to read because what I'm going to do is from this, I'm going to control the, the robot arm, okay? Now, uh, the... Okay, so I should be able to to control it. Um, I do one thing. Okay. So we're actually controlling it. There's a light coming. And then turn it off, you can turn. So again, we're reading from one of the USB, collecting the data and passing it through the robot arm, okay? And then you can grab. Okay? Then you can have a lot of fun trying to grab something and open your arm, etc. Okay, so moving on. It's the mind reader. So we have a mind reader. Uh, batteries uh, okay yeah I have to I shouldn't say it but I forgot the batteries so I stole them well I borrowed them from the hotel TV remote control so so with this mind reader so we always as an evangelist I'm always looking for cool demos sometimes not very useful but cool okay so, um, and, uh, they let me play with this, okay? So this is awesome. Um, so, okay, so this have, where is the USB? They have a USB dongle, so I should be able to read from the Raspberry Pi. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unhook these two guys and connect this guy. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, they use a proper package that we have to actually dig a little bit, and um, the way we do it again, we use in Java.com, again creating a, a C interface and a GNI wrapper around it, um, and the code looks very simple. So we create a mind reader. We are connected to the USB in this case, and we start reading the brain. When something changed, do something, okay? Uh, what I'm trying to do with the mind reader um, is supposed to give you like the attention and concentration level, I think those two numbers. To be honest, we haven't really figured out how it works because sometimes attention goes up, sometimes it goes down. So, not very, not very accurate. But what I'm trying to do is, for the next sample, we have going to be using the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi to move this particular airplane. And then what I'm trying to do is do it through my head. So using my, my thinking, we're gonna try to move it. So then we come into GPIOs. How do you program things like, remember those pins that I was talking about? Uh, GPIOs, IS2C, SPI, that are protocols that are being used nowadays. So we have two options. 
So you either go with Java SE or you go with Java ME, okay? If you go with Java ME, great APIs, very simple to use. You have something called the Device Access API. All you have to do is you want to talk to one of those devices, you just say open and the pin that you want to open. So it's as simple as open one. One is power, so you better don't open that one. But for example, seven, eight are GPIO pins. So you just say device manager open and what pin you're opening. So it's a very generic and easy to use interface. With Java SE, you don't have that. So what did I do for my demos, okay? So for one of the demos at the end, I actually created a homemade tablet. Um, so this is a Raspberry Pi, and this is my tablet. It's homemade, it has paper, okay? It has tape, and I make it silver so it looks more real. The good thing is I have a five years old daughter and she has an iPad. And she saw that and she said, yes, mommy, can I see Mickey Mouse in there? I'm like, no, <laughs> this is my work. So you can have a lot of fun. The screen, you can get the screens. Uh, if anybody is interested on the screen, let me know. We do have a discount. There is a manufacturer in Malaysia that does the screen. But pretty much it's a Raspberry Pi. And we're gonna talk later on. I have a, a sensor here. There is an accelerometer and a gyroscope, okay? So it's able to detect if I'm flipping the device, okay? Uh, so for this demo, I have a sensor, but I have a UI. So the best solution for me was to go for SC embedded that doesn't have the device access API. There are external APIs like Pi for Java that you can use. So I use Pi for Java. So I'm gonna show you both. The good thing is, in the future, Java SE will include the device access API. So in the future, you can just have one single program for SE or ME embedded, okay? <clears throat> so peripherals, if you're using SE embedded, Go with the um, Pi for Java, okay? Uh, library, that's where you find it. Um, two guys that created Robert Savage and Chris Walsh. Great guys. If you have questions, ping them in the Google um, groups. They're amazing and they will answer to your questions right away. <clears throat> I'm gonna lose my voice. <coughs> Now, uh, okay. Now, um, what features does it have? So pretty much everything. Uh, GPIOs, uh, if you want to define the direction of the GPIO, if it's for reading, so switch. If it's for output, you're sending an output to an LED to turn it on and off. Uh, if you're changing the state, um, if you want to listen, to changes, for example, you want to listen to what happening to a switch and do something. And then it has everything about I square C and SPI that I will talk a little bit more. Installation is very given, just add the package, the Debian package. Um, it comes with samples, so it's very easy for you to, to just see, instead of starting from scratch, grab the samples and, and do it. And the only thing that you need to do is make sure you add it to your class path for compilation and for execution. That's the only thing you need, okay? That's all. Now, how does peripherals work with Java ME embedded? Um, so we have, again, the device access API, and we're gonna see a little bit more in the next. So let's, let's look into code, and this is where I'm gonna bore you a little bit, but I really need to show you how things work. First one, you're gonna connect a switch to the, um, to the um, Raspberry Pi, okay? In this case, you are connected um, to uh, pin number two. As you can see, the numbers are not the order of the pins, so be aware of that, okay? 
So this is how the code looks like if you're using Py for Java. Okay? It's not that bad. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a controller. The controller is the one that allows you to create that instance of the pin. So you create a GPIO controller to the GPIO factory. Okay? So the factory gives you a controller. From the controller, allow you to create an input pin, in this case, or an output pin, depends what you want to create. And some information. In this case, okay, we're going to try to connect to pin number two, and I'm going to list it on pull down. So whenever everybody push it, we're going to hear for those changes. Okay? And then we are a listener. We need to listen when something happens. Okay? So we have a GPIO pin listener G digital. Okay? When something change, do something. Okay? So this is the Java SE version using Pi for Java. How does it look if we use them better, the, uh, M, uh, the device access API? So with the device access API, everything happens through the peripheral manager. So you get a peripheral manager and you say open and the pin that you want to open. It could be either a number if you want to take the default values or you can use a configuration. Configuration is when you need to provide more information. So in this case, I need a configuration because I'm saying, okay, I'm going to connect to pin number uh, 17 in this case. I want to only for input. I want the default. I want to trigger on rising edge and the original value is false. Okay? So if I want to set some configuration into that pin, you create this configuration object and that's the one you use for the opening. But again, you can, I could just say peripheral manager dot open 17. Okay? But that will take the default values for the pin. Okay? So you created a pin and then you set a listener. So I'm listening to changes. When something happened, change value, we verify who was it. Was it a button one that we hear some changes? And then what we're doing in this case, we have a switch and we have an LAD. So when I hear the switch going down, I'm going to change the value of the LAD. Changing the value of LAD is just setting, again, it's a GPIO pin. You just say set value. So what we're doing is we just toggle the value of the LED. If it's on, we turn it off. If it's off, we turn it on. Okay? How you read it, get value. How you change it, set value. Okay? It's that simple. So if you want to connect a Lego robot, how does it work? So in this case, um, we use a L293 dual bridge to control two motors. Okay? And how does it work? It's very simple. You get two GPIO lines from the Raspberry Pi, four in total, if you want to connect two motors. In my case, I only have one motor connected. You need power and ground, and that's pretty much it. Okay? So what I have to do is I have to connect to those pins and set the value either zero or one to move the motor. Okay? So this is the program for manipulating the motor okay so again i'm going to create a pin um, i use the peripheral manager open method and i provide a configuration the configuration what we're trying to say is i want to use pin three sometimes the pin are grouped into ports so they could be association of ports and then there are pins within that port uh, how do I find out these numbers? Just look at the specification of the Raspberry Pi. So it's nothing that I invented. It, it comes with the Raspberry Pi. So I know that the pin that I need in the Raspberry Pi is pin number three or port, on port seven. Okay? I only need output because all I'm saying is motor move. So I'm just sending signals to the motor to move or stop. The default mode it's not going to trigger anything. I'm not going to listen to the motor. And original is false. So it's not moving. Okay? And then when I need it to move, just set it to true. And that's all you need to do. Okay? 
So let's connect that guy. Um, mm -hmm. Gonna put my computer down here. Okay, so let's clean up a little bit. Okay, let's put the camera to see if I can show you. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the Raspberry Pi and the pins. Um, so we already have the dongle connected to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the motor. So the motor is right here. Give me one second, sorry. Uh, so we have the motor here inside, okay? My airplane is falling apart. Here we have the circuit using that chip. The only thing that I need to do is connect the two pins I'm gonna plug it and then show it to you. Okay, um, so all I have is connected some of them to ground and voltage, and this one are GPIOs, two GPIOs, okay? Um, Okay, now mind reader, okay. So what I'm gonna try to do is put it in. This has to go to my forehead and do touch. This go to my ear. Okay, and then I need to turn it on. Okay. And now let's see if we can actually read my mind. Oh, we got disconnected. Okay. Let's try to connect again to the Raspberry Pi. Sometimes when you connect, the Raspberry Pi can also be powered by the USBs. So sometimes when you unplug or plug something to the USB, it gets rebooted because it thinks that it's a new power. So. It probably rebooted when I put the, the mind reader dongle. Okay. Let's think. So it does read something. We are not very sure what it's reading, but it does read something, okay? So now, let's try to use my brain to move the motor. So what is happening is every time it sends some difference in my attention or concentration, it will move the motor to either way. So whenever there is difference, it is actually turned to the right or to the left, okay? So again, not very useful, but should a lot of fun, okay? Um, so all I'm doing is reading my mind using those values. If I see changes, Go to the pins, the GPIO pins of the motors, and just make it move. Turn it into true or false to send it to one direction or the other, okay? 
Oh, that was a big jump. 170. Wow. Oh, in, play, in Bali Plata. Okay. Okay, so those are GPIOs. Let me get this funny thing off my head. Okay, next. Unplug all this. Good, okay. Now, I square C. How many of you are familiar with I square C? Okay, very few. I'm glad because I, I didn't know anything about it before I started the demo. So I was like, okay. Um, to my surprise, is there are so many devices that use I square C as a protocol. So, for example, the Wii, the Wii Motion Plus uses I square C. So you can. Take it apart, connect it to your Raspberry Pi, and have a more accurate reading using uh, Wii Remote, the Wii set Motion Plus. So with I Square C, you don't really need to go into many details because the APIs pretty much hide everything for you. So what you need to know is a way to move data among um, devices. Is well known nowadays. It uses serial interfaces. Uh, pretty much what we have is two buses. One bus is for data and one bus is for clock. So the clock is the one that defines when the data is transferred. Okay? We're going to have one master and multiple slaves. The good thing, even though we have two pins on the Raspberry Pi for SAP, the bus could be shared among multiple sensors or devices as long as they have different IP addresses. So you can actually connect multiple things to the same bus. Um, be careful. To my surprise, so whenever you're working with sensors, you connect things and you just expect everything to work. That's normally not the case. Nothing is going to work at the beginning. First thing that I found, even the Raspberry Pi has I square C, is not enabled. It's in the blacklist. There is a blacklist file, and, and the I square C and SPI are there. So these are just the steps um, that you have to follow. I blog about it, so if you want to connect anything, you can look at my blog. Um, just wanted to make sure you know they are not there by default. Um, Make sure, um, one thing before I forget, follow that step. And one thing that I found handy is install some tools, the I square C tools that are very handy. Sometimes you connect things and you need to make sure that the hardware is able to see the device before even going to Java, okay? So the first thing with this uh, I square C tools you can actually use I square C detect to see, oh, you cannot see. <laughs> okay, here, there's supposed to be a table that you cannot really see. And the idea with the table, it will tell you the address of your device. If, it, if the hardware itself, if the Raspberry Pi is able to see what you just connected. So if you see the device, you're able to connect to it, okay? So you enable I square C on the pies. You make sure once you connect it, you are able to see it on with I square C connect. And then you're ready to start programming, OK? How do you program, OK? So again, two cases, two scenarios. With Java SE, um, I use this particular chip uh, because it has so many things on it. It has an accelerometer, so it actually able to see any acceleration, okay? Um, acceleration against gravity. So what it's really giving you, if you tilt the device, you can measure the angle that you're doing against gravity, okay? With the gyroscope, you have an angular acceleration. So as you rotate, you get an angular acceleration, how fast you did the rotation, okay? 
why I needed both because I need to move the UI using uh, when I move it I wanted to move my UI but if you still tilt it I want to keep moving only when you're flat the UI won't move okay that was part of my demo so again any device that is I square C um, how do you connect to your Raspberry Pi is one-to-one -one connection so it's extremely easy Normally for I square C, you need a pull-up resistor. So you need to put a resistor between your device uh, and, the, and the bus lines, either the, the data bus or the clock line. The good thing, the Raspberry Pi already has the pull-up resistors. So you don't need any resistors. You just connect directly your device, SDA, the data channel to your pin, the second one is the SDA uh, pin on the Raspberry Pi. You connect the clock line to your clock on the Raspberry Pi. Voltage to voltage, ground to ground. Then how you program? Extremely easy. Uh, so here, for example, you have, um, you get an instance of your bus, okay? You get the device. This address is the address that comes from manufacture. So the chip that I was using was 68, okay? The funny things for this, okay, again, playing with hardware, it never, you, you always get what you are not expecting. So you connect a sensor, and you expect to start sensing right away, right? I mean, that's what the sensors are for, to sense. Well, this particular sensor is on a sleep mode. So unless you wake him up, it doesn't sense. So it took me a while to realize that I have to write zeros in this particular registry to be able to start sensing. This is particular for the sensor that I was using, okay? So it has nothing to do with Java or anything. It really depends on the hardware, okay? And then how you read and write from the device, so reading sensors. Um, the way that you do is you do a read on the device and you'd say how many, where you want to start reading and how many bytes you're going to read. Okay, so that's what we're pretty much saying. We're saying, I want to start reading in here, in this address. I want to take, I want the result, the data to be, re re to be read, to be stored here. And I want to store, I want to read six bytes. Okay? The reason for six bytes is this particular sensor, each value, so it's three dimensional, we have X, Y, and Z. Each value uses two bytes. So that's why I need to read six bytes. To have two bytes for X reading, two bytes for Y, and two bytes for Z, okay? So this is all I'm doing. Reading two, two, and two, and combining those. And the same for gyroscope. So let's have a look at the demo before they kick me out off the stage. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this guy, my homemade tablet. Um, oh, hold on. I didn't. I didn't connect the. Um, the keyboard. Okay, so let's try one more time. So I'm not expecting you to, to see those tiny letters. Okay, so I'm going to log in. So if you can see here on the back, um, there is the Raspberry Pi, there is the sensor here that is connected to the GPIO lines in here. 
um, this screen in particular is connected to HDMI and the way it works is we power the screen and the screen is the one that powered the Raspberry Pi. We do have a touch, uh, it's a touch screen, so the touch sensor is here, it's coming through a USB, okay? And it does have a um, um, light sensor here, so it is actually to adjust the screen, okay? So, Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to, what I'm trying to do with this demo is I'm reading the information from the sensors and I'm using something that is called the parallax effect. Parallax effect is, is nothing new, it's been used for a while for programming uh, games. And the, the things that they do is, on embedded devices, we don't have that much power, okay? So having a 3D interface is very, it's probably not the best options. So parallax allow you to create multiple layers, have different layers, and the closer layer to you, the fastest is going to move. So imagine when you're driving a car, you see a mountain and you see a tree. The tree is closer to you. The tree seems to move faster than the mountain or the clouds that are behind the mountain. So the closer the object it is to you, it's gonna move faster. It's not that it's moving, it's that your perception to that object change faster. So that's the, the idea here. I have multiple layers. You see one flat screen, but there are multiple layers. And as I flip the device, we should move the layers on a different speed. So it gives you an idea or kind of a 3D simulation, okay? So hopefully you can see it in there. So when I move it, It's hard for me to. So you can see, let me. So you can see how the layers move at a different speed. So for example, let me go back. So as you move, you can be d discovering things like this treasure over here, and then do something. It's hard. For if anybody want to play at the end, um, but this is the whole idea. So the closer to you, the faster it moves. The farther away, the slower it moves. So it gives you that impression of, you know, kind of 3D immersion. So with that, um, again, I think, there is so much fun that you can have with the Raspberry Pi. I mean, there are so many things that you can connect. My next project is to build um, um, wearable kind of things. So again, I, there are many sensors for monitoring your heart rate, do monitoring your pulse, uh, things like that. I found actually a pair of glasses. Uh, of course, not like the Google glasses, but a good display. So I'm trying to take that display and mount it into a basket cap and to have the Raspberry Pi display the information in there. Things like that. I mean, you can have a lot of fun. There is a lot of devices. Again, there is nothing new. It's just the way you program hardware, but it's the same Java language. So um, I didn't mention, but if you want, um, you can use NetBeans. So I can have NetBeans, have my project in NetBeans, and when I say run, I can say run on my Raspberry Pi, and by default, it deploys your application straight to your Raspberry Pi right away. So it's actually very powerful, the things that you can do with the tools too. So again, in one hour, I didn't have time to show you tools and all, but again, it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of things that you can do. If you're interested, um, 
you can go to my blog, blogs.oracle.com slash and it's step by step how to get started with the Raspberry Pi or how to get the iOS Square C working. The code is available and every project that I do is posted in there. So, um, and with that, thank you very much. Any question, if anybody wanna come closer and look with the screen, or anything, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Oh yes, tomorrow, before I forget, there is a hackathon. Um, so they're gonna be from 10 a.m. Uh, uh, with the Java user group, so it's the second row in the back. They're gonna be starting a hackathon. Oh. It's on the cross space stage. Okay. Hold on, no. In Portuguese. Boa noite, pessoal. Muito obrigada a todos. O Hackathon vai começar oficialmente amanhã às 10 horas no Cross Space, ali do lado do palco principal. Nós vamos fazer mais uma introdução e às 2h30 tem um workshop prático com os kits. Vem mão na massa com a Angela e com o Vinícius Sanger. 2h30 no espaço de workshop. Então 10 da manhã no Cross Space, 2h30 workshop. I heard workshop, so Hello. So we have the workshops. We have 20 kids. We have the screens. I brought sensors. We have the bread a bit, the the boards. We have the cables, so you will be able to do your wiring and have a little fun. So hopefully see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>